Okay, I just took a caffeine pill. I'm going to talk to you as quickly as I can about everything you ever wanted to know about contrast. I'm sp focusing specifically on IV contrast. And the reason that we're doing this um, is because, as we all know, this stuff can lead to death, which leads to lawsuits, which leads to people not being happy for a variety of reasons. The other purpose to it is that um, this is the primary uh, aspect of patient care that we're being tested on for this, and it's a big part of our job, SCT techs. So here's the objectives I've identified. We want to talk about the properties of IV contrast agents, um, talk about how these things contribute to adverse effects and contrast reactions. We'll differentiate between idiosyncratic and uh, chemotoxic reactions, talk about what those are, give definitions, talk about IV contrast and uh, different aspects of the body like the kidney function, or respiratory effects, things like that. Talk about injection. We'll briefly talk about oral contrast like barium and stuff like that, and we're going to talk about um, how to apply all of this understanding to giving people warm, weird feelings. Because I know that's what you told all of your kindergarten teachers that first day of kindergarten when she asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? You said, I want to give people weird feelings and warm feelings, right? Okay. So contrast agents, what are they? They can help us distinguish between adjacent tissues on the CT scan. So we can give them IV or orally, and that's the reason we're able to see this aortic dissection on this image here. So there's both positive and negative contrast agents. Positive are things like barium and iodine, which again is the reason we're able to see the aortic dissection, but we sometimes don't think about the negative agents, which is the reason we're able to see this patient needs to have a fart. Basically, in their lower pelvic area, there's a lot of gas in the rectum. So um, IV contrast agents um, are largely iodinated, and we use that because they're water-soluble, they're easy to administer, and relatively safe. Um, they are going to give us a wide different differentiation and attenuation because it's iodine, which is metalloid, and so it attenuates more x-rays than, you know, normal blood. So properties that we are considering when we inject these things into people's bodies, number one is osmolality, and it's just the number of particles in solution. So we have HOCMs and LOCMs, high osmolality contrast medias like have seven times the osmolality or particles in solution per blood versus low osmolality, which is what we primary, primarily use, have roughly twice the amount of particles in solution per blood. Uh, isoosmolar, which is just a fancy term for it's the same osmolality as blood. Viscosity is a significant thing, and I think it does contribute in a large part to a lot of the idiosyncratic reactions and chemotoxic effects of IV contrast. This has to do with the thickness or friction of the fluid. Um, and one of the things I always think about is we're basically injecting something that has the same stickiness as Coca-Cola into someone's veins, right? Um, and when I consider that I can actually clean blood off a carpet with Coca-Cola or whatever, I mean, you can look at all the weird stuff you can clean up with Coca-Cola on the internet. Um, think about that and think about what we're injecting into the patient's body. Um, there could potentially be problems related to that viscosity difference. Ionicity is the property of contrast media where it dissociates into ions. Um, and so a non-ionic contrast agent has molecules in it that do not associate, dissociate real easily. So non-ionic contrasts generally are low osmolality as well, um, but that's not always necessarily the case, but we do lar largely use non-ionic contrast media. Clearance just means how quickly can the kidneys get rid of it. Um, normally for most normal kidney function, it's about two hours is the half-life. So when patients are really concerned about a contrast injection, you can let them know most of the stuff your body's gonna get rid of and excrete within the next 10 minutes, right? And then over half of it will be done within 24 hours. Um, well over half, I should say. So um, dose, uh, this is really an expression of how much iodine is in it, right? Um, so, and also the volume of contrast that we're administering. So when we look at that ionic that iodine concentration plus the volume delivered, that's what we're considering when we do dose. So here's a review question. How many grams of iodine will be delivered? 100 ml of agent with uh, 320 milligrams of iodine um, per milliliter is injected. You can just multiply those two together and you'll get 32 grams of iodine. Now this is important to us when we're thinking about adults versus children. That's the main thing that we need to consider when we talk about dose. Um, for the most part, when we're doing adults, we use a fairly like, uniform dose, um, which doesn't necessarily make sense. It might make sense to kind of dose them based on their weight, which is what we do with kids. For the most part, the formula is 2 milliliters per kilogram for the kids. Pregnancy. Um, people have wondered, is it, is it impactful on pregnancy? The ACRs release some stuff, and we'll, we'll look at that later on with an activity. Um, but for the most part, um, 
The main concern that we have with CT scan in pregnancy is, of course, the ionizing radiation. But there is also some concern related to the IV contrast, and that's continued to be researched. Right now, we don't have any evidence that, there, that it poses a risk. So the question then is, well, what about breast milk? Um, it would be a very, very small amount of IV contrast that would wind up in patient breast milk. Um, so generally, it's believed that a mother and infant can continue breastfeeding after receiving IV contrast media. So what are the adverse effects, though? So we're shifting gears just a little bit, and we're trying to think about, well, what are the things we need to avoid um, in the course of our work with this stuff? Um, and we should first off stress that this is largely a very, very safe um, form of, of seeing what we need to see on these, on these images. And the fatalities are extremely rare. Um, so even though they're rare, we still want to be safe in the way that we administer this stuff. And so we need to be trained in the ways to respond quickly. So one of the first things that we should do when we are new to a facility is identify what their contrast media reaction protocol is, identify where all the supplies are, things like that. So oftentimes we use the term contrast reaction um, in a variety of different ways. Um, so this might include things like what I would call an adverse um, effect um, versus a contrast reaction. So um, adverse effects are those things that like it we don't like the way it feels like it feels kind of warm it feels like I wet my pants it tastes like metal I had one patient tell me it tastes like bad tequila um, I had one person grab me and, and threaten me and tell me that I had to tell all my patients that it makes them feel like they, they peed all over themselves it was literally the words that she said um, I would call that an adverse effect so that's different from what I'm talking about with contrast reaction so contrast media reactions are loose, loosely grouped into two different categories there's chemotoxic reactions which are a result to the psychochemical, uh, physiochemical properties of the contrast media, dose, how quickly you inject it, and then idiosyncratic reactions are largely su uh, subjective in nature, um, and they mimic, in some ways, a, an allergic reaction. So sometimes the terminology used for it is anaphylactoid, which means it's like an anaphylactic shock. Um, it is not actually an allergic reaction, though, because per people can receive contrast media and not have a reaction to it. So that's one of the ways it's differentiated from an actual anaphylactic reaction. We'll talk more about that, but that's why we use the term idiosyncratic. We don't fully understand why it's caused. We don't understand all the triggering mechanisms to it. Um, so we, uh, it's not really correct to call it an allergy because true allergies um, result from the production of antibodies, which are not found in contrast media reactions. Um, and, in, and like I said earlier, the severity of the reaction would, would increase with re-exposure, which, which is not true of contrast media reactions. So we refer to them as allergy-like or anaphylactoid. Um, and it's not really accurate to call it a contrast allergy, although you'll hear people call it that. So what are these different levels of acute idiosyncratic reactions? Um, and they do happen quickly. Um, normally within about two minutes of injection, we will start to see some one of these reactions if the person is going to have an, an acute idiosyncratic reaction. They're mild, which are short duration and, and self-limiting, so the patient's more or less able to get themselves back on course moderate, um, but we need to intervene. And then severe is these are potentially or immediately life-threatening, so we need to intervene quickly. So uh, what are the risk factors for these idiosyncratic reactions? Well, if the person ever has had a uh, contrast media reaction in the past, that does need to be documented. If they have a history of, aller of, of asthma, that needs to be documented. Um, a long, long risk list of food and drug allergies is something that needs to be documented as well. Although one little caveat, seafood allergies are not a particular risk. So there was a myth that went around for quite some time that there was a link between the iodine that contained contained in like shellfish and the iodine that we use in IV contrast reactions or I IV contrast injections. And there's not really any associated risk between uh, shellfish allergy and uh, contrast media reactions. So what are the ways that we prevent these things? Well, first off, we need to make sure that we have good history on all of our patients. Um, we can choose to perform the examination without contrast media. This is something that we would need to talk to the ordering physician and the reading interpreting physician, the radiologist about. So it's ultimately the interpreting physician's determination to make whether or not we're going to use the IV contrast for a particular exam. We definitely always want to use low osmolality contrast media. And a lot of different facilities have pre-treatment with steroids. So like uh, Benadryl, prednisone, 
like 24 hours prior to the uh, test. And also documentation, document, 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 uh, what kinds of reaction is had, communicating that to the patient, all of those kind of final outcome considerations need to be um, placed down. Most facilities will require you to fill out some kind of like um, event report or something to indicate that yes, this patient did have this occur and here's what we've, here's the steps for follow up. All right, switching gears just a little bit. So that was all the stuff, considerations of idiosyncratic reactions. We're gonna talk about the chemotoxic parts to it now, and these largely have to do with the body function stuff. So the functionality of contrast media. And the big one is contrast media induced nephropathy or CIN. Uh, we'll also talk about pulmonary stuff, thyroid stuff, and central nervous, as well as delayed reactions. So um, one thing that we should understand, uh, IV contrast media can affect kidney function. In fact, any amount of IV contrast affects kidney physiology and kidney function. Um, but I, at the same time, I would say any amount of Coca-Cola or any amount of maple syrup affects kidney function and uh, reduces glomerular filtration. Why is that? Well, this stuff is sticky. It goes back to that point about viscosity, right? So we need to be careful um, in understanding that. But we also, when the patients have a concern, we can address that and saying, look, the nephrotoxic effects of contrast media are equivalent to like drinking too much Coca-Cola or drinking too much Dr. Pepper, that type of thing. Um, nevertheless, we do need to screen patients who may be at a higher risk for nef nephropathy. And that's what we're doing with the contrast in media induced nephropathy considerations. So what we're looking at is the functionality of the kidney and we're using labs to assess whether or not the kidneys are functioning well. Um, so the labs that we're interested in primarily are the GFR or an eGFR and the serum creatinine, which is all, a lot of times you just use to calculate the GFR. So um, GFR is a little cumbersome, but what it, it's a little bit more accurate as well. It takes into account things like the patient's age, gender, and ethnicity, because there are people of certain ethnicities, like African Americans, who are at a higher risk for um, impaired kidney function. So the GFR includes all of those things. Serum creatinine is just measuring the amount of a waste product in the blood, and it allows us to know, okay, well, if we see a lot of this waste product, creatinine, in the blood, then the kidneys aren't functioning very well to filter that waste product out. So that's what the serum creatinine tells us, and the book gives us some ranges for what's appropriate. Um, for a lot of facilities, like the cutoff is around 1.2 serum creatinine. Anything less than that, we're okay. Comparing that to the GFR, um, so serum creatinine, as it gets higher and higher and higher, the kidney function is decreasing. So it's an indirect relationship. With the GFR, it's a direct relationship. As we see the GFR go down, kidney function is also going down. So with the GFR, we want high numbers, not low numbers. With the serum creatinine, we want low numbers, not high numbers. All of this is measuring renal dysfunction or functionality. And some terms that we need to be familiar with, renal failure is just like complete inability of the kidneys to, get, to maintain homeostasis and get, and get rid of nitrogenous waste. Renal insufficiency, insufficiency just means that the kidneys are working really, really hard um, and they're struggling. Nephropathy means that there's some kind of underlying condition that may be causing the renal problems. Um, so sometimes it's used synonymously with renal impairment. So... After we inject contrast media, um, there is a risk for some form of contrast-induced nephropathy. And this just, again, goes back to this stuff is sticky. Are the kidneys able to get rid of it, or is it getting stuck in the kidneys? Um, so what we would do is measure serum creatinine, and if it's, if it's continuing to increase, if the amount of creatinine in the blood is increasing after the contrast media injection, then we need to do something to treat that. So what are the risk factors? Like I mentioned before, creatinine clearance levels are low, um, so they're not getting rid of it. There's no clearance for it. Um, history of diabetes mellitus, um, recent administration of iodine contrast media. So we have a frequent flyer, someone that we're doing a lot of injections on, and they just had a CT scan two days ago. Well, we are increasing their risks significantly by doing the next exam with the IV contrast, um, using a large amount of contrast media, and also history of congestive heart failure because the amount of blood that's circulating through the kidneys is directly tied to how strong the heart is. So what are things that we can do to prevent this? Well, screen the patients, use low osmolality contrast media, minimize the contrast volume, ensure adequate uh, hydration. A lot of facilities, after you've done the contrast media, they'll you know do some kind of uh, IV hydration, um, and you may be part of, of that decision-making process. So 
Um, anytime you see a patient with an elevated creatinine, you definitely need to be talking to the physician and, and talking to the interpreting physician to, to determine how best to care for the patient and whether or not to do the IV contrast injection. Um, metformin is one of these areas of controversy right now. Uh, so it, is, it can be tied to renal dysfunction because it's impacting the way that the kidneys function in order to alter the way that um, blood sugars are working. Um, that's my really, really simplistic de uh, description of it. The concern is that it could, uh, if, we, if we have contrast media on board with metformin, it could trigger some kind of lactic acidosis um, situation, which can be really, really scary. Um, as of right now, though, we have that's theoretical, and we've not yet seen that actually happen, to my knowledge, and I think the ACR is continuing to monitor that. Um, dialysis of con is an area of interest as well. Um, for the most part, uh, we should not be giving contrast media to a patient if the dialysis intervention is something that's temporary. Like, for example, as a treatment for contrast-induced nephropathy, we shouldn't be giving them more contrast if they're on dialysis because we cause nephropathy, right? Kind of a no-brainer. But um, if we have a patient with end-stage renal failure and they're, you know, go to dialysis every other day, we're fine to give them the, the contrast because the dialysis is just going to get rid of it the next time they go to dialysis. It is helpful to know that they're on dialysis, so we need to have that screening and also figure out why they're on dialysis. Um, so another totally different function. So the main main area of the body that we're concerned with is the kidneys anytime we're giving IV contrast, but it does, it does affect other functionality of other parts of the body. Another area of concern is the thyroid. We are not worried about patients who have hypothyroidism. So an under-functioning thyroid, we don't care. If we have a patient who has hyperthyroidism, we are concerned, right? So hyper, hypo, we are concerned with the hyper folks, right? Hyperthyroidism, it can precipitate a thyroid storm, which is a life-threatening condition caused by uh, overactivity of the thyroid. In terms of the lungs, uh, contrast media can cause bronchospasms, uh, arterial hypertension, pulmonary edema. So these are all on the severe end of these idiosyncratic reactions. Um, and so any patient who has a history of pulmonary hypertension, bronchial asthma, or heart failure, they are high on our list of people that we probably don't want to give IV contrast to. Um, the use of low osmolality contrast media will significantly reduce the risk, but we definitely need to document, document, document all those things and talk about them because of the severity of the response that's associated with those uh, pulmonary conditions. Finally, central nervous system. Uh, interestingly enough, contrast media has been shown to provoke seizures in patients who have diseases that disrupt the brain-blood barrier. Um, one of the easiest ways to reduce the risk of seizure during CT scanning with IV contrast is to give an oral dose of diazepam or Valium 30 minutes prior to this contrast media in administration. And in fact, that sounds like a good idea for all of us, our patients. Let's just give everyone Valium 30 minutes prior to scanning. I think it would make everyone's life easier, even the techs. Delayed reactions. So there is out there floating around one or two cases of people having contrast reactions an hour up to a week after contrast media injection. I've only heard of one case uh, out, out as far out as a week. Um, it's difficult to accurately collect that type of data because um, oftentimes the patient doesn't even notice it. Uh, so what we're talking about, the further out we get from injection, the further we are post-injection, the less the reaction will be, right? So that's another thing we can assure our patients with. Um, if you are going to have a contrast reaction, we will see it in the time that you're here in the department. You'll see it within the next two to five minutes, right? If it is something that happens 24 hours out from now, it will be significantly reduced in its effect, like a rash, and that would be pretty much it. Um, yeah. All right, let's talk just about a little bit about GI stuff, oral contrast, rectal contrast, that type of thing. This is helpful for looking at the loops of the bowel, differentiating that between a cyst, an abscess, any kind of cancer. So for the most part, we use oral. Um, sometimes we use rectal contrast, particularly if we're looking at appendicitis in an emergent care situation and they want to be able to evacuate the bowels quickly in order to get the patient to surgery. One of our favorite ones to use is going to be um, positive contrast agents. Um, although we still use some negative contrast agents, for the most part, positive contrast agents are gonna have a positive Hounsfeld value and the negative stuff will have a negative Hounsfeld value. Water is considered neutral 
I don't know what that means. I guess it's because the Hounsfield scale is zero dome water. Um, if you ask me, it winds up being slightly positive in the way that it appears on the images. So barium sulfate is going to be our number one go-to. Um, it is oftentimes given anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours prior to the actual CT scan. So if we have a patient scheduled for a CT admin and pelvis, they'll show up in the department two hours prior to the scan. We'll give them some barium, they'll drink the barium, and then in two hours we'll do the scan. Sometimes we use a low osmolality uh, barium suspension. Um, and uh, oftentimes this is the case for CT. We don't want to use the same kind of barium that they use in the radiology department. Um, simply because it will cause streaks and beam hardening on our images. Anytime the patient is, has a suspected bowel perforation or fistula, things like that, inflammation, um, or if there's a risk of aspiration, we want to avoid the use of barium um, because barium can cause like barium peritonitis and things like that. Um, aspiration, it can cause uh, really creepy um, imaging of the bronch. The bronch the bronchioles as it gets down into the lungs. Sometimes we use an iodinated contrast media for um, oral administration. If you thought barium tastes bad, generally this stuff tastes worse. Um, so it's the stuff, if you've ever seen a technologist add gastrographin to apple juice or crystal light or something like that, um, that's what they're doing. They're using a low osmolality or high osmolality contrast media, diluting it with uh, fruit juice and then giving it to the the patient. There's some advantages and disadvantages with this. One advantage is that we're not as concerned with this in terms of bowel perforation. So if we have a patient with suspected bowel perforation, this is the kind of um, oral contrast that we need to use. Um, but at the same time, it's not always going to be as pretty a picture as the barium provides. Water um, has been in the literature more and more. Um, it's helpful in that it doesn't obscure mucosal surfaces and it transits rapidly, but it doesn't distend the bowel very well. So like with barium, you get this nice fully distended bowel and you're able to evaluate all aspects of the bowel and see a polyp really clearly. With water, not so much. It doesn't distend the bowel and so we get, uh, by the time it's gotten to the large intestine, pretty much all of it has been um, reabsorbed into the system. And in carbon dioxide, we will sometimes use, I mean, we use air every time we ask a patient to take a deep breath in and hold it. We're using that as a form of negative contrast. We're also using it as a way to prevent patient motion. Um, I guess what I'm thinking about here is like in the CT colonography, they will actually administer air rectally or maybe a carbon dioxide rec rectally um, and then CT scan the patient with basically after having blown up their large intestine like a balloon, if that makes sense. Um, so this is just another form of negative contrast. Fortunately, I've never had the uh, opportunity to, to experience these kinds of exams or to participate in them because they sound kind of uncomfortable and weird to me. But they're helpful, I guess, if we're looking for a polyp. Finally, intrathecally, anytime we administer contrast into the um, sheath around the spinal cord, we'll call that intrathecal contrast administration. Oftentimes it's done under fluoro guidance, so we'll introduce a needle into the intrathecal area, inject contrast into that. Um, under again under normal uh, radiographic fluoroscopy and then they bring them over to the CT department we have them roll around a couple of times on the CT scan table so that we fully coat the uh, spinal cord with the IV contrast or the intrathecal contrast and then we scan them for like to evaluate their their spine or their lumbar spine and is there compression on the spine caused by lumbar discs and things like that. Oftentimes this is indicated for patients that can't tolerate MRI for one reason or another or if they've already had spinal surgery and so there's metal um, in their spine and so the metal is showing up as, a, as an artifact on the MRI image and obscuring what they need to see on the MRI. Um, so this is kind of a second line of defense um, for patients who are post-op with uh, lo like lower back surgery. All right. Switching gears yet again, let's talk about injection techniques. So I'm toggling back to IV contrast considerations and just thinking about the ways that the actual injections influence patient care. Everything from vascular access, the type of exam that we're doing, and the very specific clinical indications. So anytime we're planning a patient for CT scanning, we want to think about what are, how are we going to administer the contrast, how quickly are we going to use it. The primary way that we administer contrast for most adult patients is going to be a mechanical injector. So we've got this little robot friend with a syringe mounted to it and oftentimes a warmer to keep the contrast media warm because that improves its viscosity, it reduces the friction. 
and we're going to use that mechanical injector to inject it because it controls for volume and concentration and dose and everything else. Um, we are interested in how quickly the, uh, the contrast is flowing into the patient, the delay between the initiation of injection and when the scanner starts, as well as whether or not we're going to be using any kind of saline flush post because you have these fancy injectors that can inject both contrast and saline. So the first thing we need to think about is IV, is IV access. Is it stable? Um, we want, uh, you know, like generally like an, a 20 gauge or better, um, 18 gauge antecubital. Um, we generally avoid using anything in the back of the hand, although nurses really like the back of the hand. We don't. We want something in front of the elbow. Um, and there's various reasons for that. The primary reason for us in terms of timing has to do with we, we want to avoid any kind of diffusion of the contrast as it... Um, moves towards the heart. We can also use things like uh, pick lines, non-tunnel venous catheters. We generally avoid tunneled venous, venous catheters, so we'll look at that more here in just a minute. So the first thing we want to do is just uh, saline flush the area, so inspect it, visually inspect it, remove any... Um, uh, generally we want to avoid using the tubing that's uh, working with other stuff because we can actually blow tubing uh, given how quickly we're pushing this IV contrast. Um, and uh, we'll turn off the existing medication only long enough to complete the injection and then start the, uh, the medication right back up. Pick lines are just these long catheters that are inserted through a large vein in the upper arm and they advance to the uh, superior vena cava. Um, if it's a power pick, then we can inject through it and they're, they're classified for high injection rates. If it's not a power pick, don't mess with it. Um, Anytime we suspect it's not a power pick, uh, we can reduce the injector, injection rate somewhat um, significantly, um, or we can just hand inject it, which is really not very optimal for most of the things that we do. Uh, we should never be using uh, dialysis uh, CVCs for IV injection, so don't mess with the dialysis stuff. Anytime we use contrast media, we want to make sure that we document, document, document. So the name of the agent, the dose, the flow rate, the injection site, any adverse effects and their treatment. And we are very interested in how the tissue enhances at the area that we're scanning, right? So there's going to be three basic phases that can be kind of further broken down into specific organs. But I just want us to know about these three basic phases for right now. We'll get into the organ stuff when we look at various parts of the body. First is the bolus phase, non-equilibrium phase, and equilibrium phase. So the bolus phase can be measured with an arterial venous um, uh, iodine difference or an AVID test. And the way that this is done is you measure between the in inferior vena cava and the descending aorta. So you can see on this image here, they have an ROI set on the descending aorta and an ROI set on the inferior vena cava, and they're measuring the difference between them. It's the bolus phase if that avid has a difference of 30 or more. So if there's more contrast in the aorta than there is in the inferior vena cava, then we are in the bolus phase. There is actually contrast still being injected into the patient's body. Why do we know that? Well, because there's a lot of it in the aorta and not very much of it in the, in the inferior vena cava. Non-equilibrium phase is going to immediately follow the bolus phase. Um, and during this, we're going to have that arterial venous uh, uh, IV difference is going to be between 10 and 30 Hounsfield units. So they're starting, we still have a higher amount in the aorta than in the inferior vena cava. Why? Because it's basically arterial at this point all through the abdomen. And then finally, the equilibrium phase, there's going to be an arterial venous um, iodine difference of about 10 Hounsfield units. So they've pretty much balanced out now. The aorta and the inferior vena cava are pretty much the same. And this is going to be a time where basically the contrast is still circulating in the bloodstream. It's not being picked up completely by the kidneys, but it's becoming more and more diluted just throughout organ tissue and things like that. So it's very helpful to know the exact timing from start to end of each of these phases, and we're really interested in the timing of various injection protocols. And that's why we look at these arrival times. So we're interested in from the start of injection to the contrast reaching these various parts of the patient's body, we'll see the time increases, right? So right atrium, about 6 to 12 seconds pulmonary artery. So this would be a sweet spot for a CTA of the chest where we're looking for pulmonary embolism is about 9 to 15 seconds post-injection. Um, now this is not taking into account different rates at which we can inject. I'm assuming this is an injection rate of about 
three to four milliliters per second, right? Um, but we can see on down through as we get uh, further along in the body, things like jugular veins, renal veins, about 30 seconds, splenic vein, about 30 to 45 seconds, femoral veins, if we're looking like a runoff uh, study, it might be closer to about two minutes. All right, mechanical injectors are our friends. They're our little robot friends. Oftentimes they have two uh, syringes uh, affixed to them and we can program them to do things like pressure limit. So we know that if, if the vein is blown or whatever, we have an idea based on it exceeding a certain PSI. So we use that to prevent extravasation and, and also we need to be very careful about things like air embolism. So, <coughs> so pharmacokinetic factors, these things are largely controllable. We'll look at them in just a sec. And then patient and equipment factors, a lot of these are outside of our actual control. So pharmacokinetic factors are things like how the contrast media works, what the flow is, um, the volume that we're injecting, how long the uh, contrast injection is going to take, the actual delay time between the start of injection and when the scan begins, and the total scan time itself. So if we're using like a newer scanner, sometimes we can overshoot the contrast. If we start the scanner too soon after injection, we can scan past the contrast. With older scanners, we're worried about missing the contrast, like if the scan took too long and the contrast went into that equilibrium phrase, now we can't see what we needed to see. So these are these questions of volume, flow, duration. Um, we're really interested in like aortic enhancement for hepatic enhancement, how the blood is flowing through, and all of this is affected by both the injection rate and the scanner speed. So this is what we're talking about here in terms of these different um, aortic enhancement rates or Hounsfield levels. If we inject faster, um, we're going to get a, a bigger aortic enhancement. Um, and you can see that bolus peaking on the upper right hand corner. You can see that bolus peaking around 25 seconds in the aorta. Um, and it's a really sharp peak of enhancement. So it really, really pops in the aorta um, versus, uh, you know, if we're injecting at a, at a lower rate or something like that, we start to see these things tailing off. They don't have quite the amount of contrast that we would like to see. So we have all these things in the back of our mind, these time density curves. And very often the the contrast media injector, the mechanical injector, kind of helps you graph that out. So when you're watching the injection, if you're next time you're in the CT department, watch as they're doing the injection, and you'll actually see kind of the graph that I just showed you. So um, for the most part, if we have a constant volume, like 120 milliliters of contrast um, and a constant uh, concentration, so we didn't mess with the osmolality or whatever the contrast media, um, if there's a, if the flow rate is increased, so if I increase it from like three milliliters per second to five milliliters per second, there's going to be a de decreased time to peak and a more narrow peak, right? It's going to pop better, but I'll have a narrow window in which to get the CT scan. So very oftentimes we have to adjust the scan delay based off of our flow rate. Um, increasing the flow rate is going to also shorten the duration of the actual injection and that makes sense like if I only have 120 milliliters of contrast to inject and I'm injecting it at 3 milliliters per second that's going to take me longer than if I'm injecting it at 5 milliliters per second so for CT angiography this is a huge consideration the scan timing has to be very very precise because we have these narrow windows in which the in which the contrast blushes or or shows up really clear in the, in the structure that we're trying to visualize, whether that's the pulmonary arteries, um, the carotid arteries, the circle of Willis, or a runoff study. So manipulating flow rate is a key consideration to CT scan protocols, and it's something we're going to be looking at quite a bit this summer. All right, what are these patient equip equipment factors that are actually outside of our control? Well, it's things like cardiac, cardiac put out, um, like how, how well the patient's heart is functioning, and the patient's weight as well as the scanner speed would be an equipment factor. So <clears throat> one of the things that we'll do is we can measure uh, things like the patient's uh, cardio weight because we can actually cause a back flow into the um, heart if, we, if our bolus is too powerful for the heart. So we do things like bolus triggering, um, a test bolus to see just how the patient's cardiac output is working prior to doing the actual injection. So these test boluses a lot of times are, we'll take a short, a small amount of contrast media, inject it, um, 
scan axially at the area of interest and see how long it's taking the contrast to blush in that area. Bullish triggering is very similar to that. So now what we're going to do is once we've established, hey, we're trying to do a CTA of the chest, we want the contrast to the bolus to peak inside of the um, pulmonary arteries, we will look at the level of the pulmonary arteries. So we'll scan, we'll initiate the injection, we'll scan repeatedly at the level of the pulmonary arteries until we see the contrast hit the pulmonary arteries and then we'll start the actual CT scan and the machine will initiate the scan through the entire chest. So uh, behind all of this is questions of appropriateness. And so this is the last thing that we're going to talk about in this uh, thing is, is all these considerations of, of risk and whether or not to do these um, riskier procedures, let's say. So the things that I've mentioned that are of significance for us, allergies, so history of allergy, history of asthma, history of kidney problems, how well their heart is functioning. Um, additionally, we should monitor the patient's anxiety level because occasionally a person's anxiety can actually cause something that looks like a contrast reaction, and these can be pretty pronounced. Like, for example, I had a patient that I scanned quite a bit when I was working as a radiation therapist. I would do diagnostic CT scanning in the morning and do radiation uh, simulations in the, in the afternoon. And I had a patient that, you know, we were following up on uh, leukemia, I think. And so he came in for CT scans about once a month. Every month when he came in for his CT scan, I knew that he would have drank his barium and he was going to barf all over the place the second that I gave him the IV contrast. That was an anxiety-related reaction. We wound up treating it with, with Valium, and he was perfectly fine. What we would ultimately wind up having to do is, I kid you not, his anxiety never really diminished completely, even with the Valium, but I would do the injection, he would throw up into like an emesis basin, and then I would do the CT scan. We just kind of got it down to a science. So anxiety, though, and anxiety attacks can look very similar to the um, anaphylactoid reaction that we see with some patients from contrast media. Other things that we're concerned with are things like multiple myeloma, uh, pheochromocytoma, which patients always ask me, like, what is that? And I'll say, well, you, you know if you have it. Sickle cell anemia, hyperthyroidism, like I mentioned before, and carcinoma of the thyroid. Okay, we haven't really touched on uh, extravasation, but it's kind of a no-brainer. If I'm using a, a mechanical injector on you and injecting at rates of like three milliliters per second, I can blow your veins pretty easy, which is one of the reasons, again, we want an antecubital vein in front of the, um, in front of the elbow because it's, it's just a larger vein. It's closer to the heart. So get the patient's full cooperation. Make sure that they communicate appropriately with you. Um, communication is going to be a significant way of reducing that. Make sure that you have a good IV. Test flush the IV prior to injection. Um, and be aware that if the patient bends their arm, they could actually kink off the cannula. So I've seen contrast media extravasations just caused because the patient bended their arm. Keep their arm straight, even if they have to bring them up over their head. And, and whenever possible, while you're doing the injection, be in the scan room, palpating the arm and feeling as the contrast media flows into the vein. Um, yes, it can extravasate internally, um, but the primary form of extravasation that we're concerned with is extravasating at the site of injection. So all of, the other thing that we can do to minimize all of these things is, again, using low osmolality contrast media. Again, kind of a no-brainer. Reducing low osmolality to roughly twice that of blood is going to create less problems if we're injecting this stuff into the blood system. This is some ACR material that we'll be looking at a little bit more. And so I want you to be familiar with these charts. Um, we're going to dig into the ACR contrast media manual here for one of our activities. Um, so you may want to familiarize yourself with this stuff. I like this, that it breaks it down between the physiological and the allergy-like for mild, moderate, and also severe reactions. These are the ones that we're the most concerned with in terms of needing acute intervention. <clears throat> And then when we're talking about how to treat this stuff, questions we need to be asking ourselves. If you are participating in a CT scan and you see a patient have an adverse reaction, how do they look? Are they able to talk? What are their vocal sounds? How are they, how are they breathing? What's their blood pressure? What's their pulse strength and rate? These are just all the other reasons why I continue to do um, vital signs on patients prior to doing any CT scan is because then I know what their baseline blood pressure and pulse strength was. Um, so if they do have a reaction, I also know what type of reaction they might be having. In terms of the contrast-induced nephropathy, the best thing that we can do is get that GFR, um, calculate that, 
be aware of other his history factors, like things like whether or not the patient's on dialysis, if they have a history of kidney transplant, renal cancer, renal surgery, anything that may be actually causing uh, kidney problems, uh, hypotension, hypertension, uh, and also use of metformin. So finally, I've mentioned that metformin has a bit of controversy. So this is the most recent information from the ACR manual that I could find, uh, at least when I was preparing these slides. Um, what they're saying right now is patients taking metformin are not at a higher risk than other patients for post-contrast uh, acute uh, kidney injury. Um, IV contrast is a concern for renal damage for patients with acute kidney injury and for patients with severe chronic kidney disease. So as of right now, there's no reported cases of lactic acid doses following intravenous contrast media. So that's why I said it's theoretical and uh, it stems from the ACR material. Here's my references for this presentation, and thank you so much.